So today we're delighted to have Michael Solori, who's a New York City-based documentary photographer. Um, his storytelling visually explores obscure locations and objects and behind the scenes of work cultures. His editorial photography has appeared in numerous American and European print and online media, such as uh, National Geographic, Wired, Smithsonian Magazine, New York Times, Washington Post, just to name a few. He's also the author of Infinite Worlds, The People and Places of Space Exploration, and that has a forward by John Glenn. And he, Michael earned his MFA from RIT and later taught there as an assistant professor. And I don't know if I wanted to save this for later, Michael, but there's a cool fun fact that you mentioned that you have an asteroid named after you. Somewhere yeah. in uh, Jupiter and Mars? Yes, <laughs> Mars and Jupiter, out there. <laughs> so that's uh, just a quick introduction. So uh, I'll, you can take it from here, Michael. You can share your screen and show us. Right, uh, hello, everybody, and those in Europe and uh, Asia, good evening. I am going to uh, share a screen and um, and while you're doing that, Michael, I just let everybody know if anybody has any questions they would like to pose to Michael, there's a chat window on the right. I'll be moderating that and kind of uh, interrupting Michael occasionally, but there's some natural pauses in which I can take some of your questions and have you uh, have Michael answer them for you. And also I'll be popping an offer up. Um, on the right hand side, you'll see something called offers in which we are giving away a free download to an ebook that was uh, written by Lester Picker, one of our other Moab masters. And it is uh, 164 fully illustrated pages of wealth of knowledge. So uh, I'll be reminding everybody about that throughout the presentation. So go ahead, Michael. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. So um, greetings, everyone. Um, as we go through this and after the, um, the webinar, um, that is my site, michaelslurry.com. And much of the things that we've discussed or I'll be discussing can be found in greater detail on the site. All right. Uh, so the notion here is um, we're going to be looking at my work behind the scenes at various um, NASA projects. But I want to give a sense of who I am and why I shoot the way I shoot as a photographer, which I've been doing for a number of decades. Um, you'll find some of that work and more links at my website, michaelsolari.com. And I urge you to check that out after the, um, after the MOAB uh, webinar here. The notion here is of light is very, very important to me. And uh, when we look at, at light, the roots for me are not only that I was born actually in Niagara Falls, which is what that is, a uh, very uh, Fellini-like town, but also that I learned to measure light. And by measuring light, it slowed me down to appreciate the qualities of light. Fortunately, a lot of my uh, trips and a lot of my projects are driven by basically my own curiosity to explore obscure locations, people, objects, and essentially behind the scenes of cultures. And I do that by essentially um, trying to become uh, a part of where I am. I don't want to stand out. I don't want to advertise that I, oh, look, I'm a photographer and I've got, you know, three, three camera bodies and long lenses. I don't. In fact, for most of my career, I have worked very simply. And we'll get into that theme of why I work very simply, from my shooting to the way I orchestrated a project to even my workflow when I'm back here um, downloading photographs and um, doing a lot of the basic flow from editing, uh, color correction, and printing. So I'm just going to go through and give you some background, show you some ideas of some of the places that I've been fortunate enough to, to visit and explore uh, people in place. Um, I work fairly simply, always. Um, this is all film and, fil and basic film, what we're seeing right now. And I work largely with wide angle lenses. I don't like telephoto lens. I, I put myself intentionally in front of people so that I'm connecting with them. I do not want to feel disconnected from anybody that I'm photographing. And these are the various explorations. Um, this is down in Brazil, uh, recent food shortage. Um, this is on a riverboat trip, Maracanã, Brazil, Rio and Rio. Dwayne Michaels, the uh, fine art photographer. 
Um, a good 15 years of my career was as a fashion photographer, both here in New York, Milan, Italy, and in Brazil. It's the uh, op-ed columnist in the New York Times, uh, Charles Blow, Nora Stubbs, a ballerina. And this, for example, was uh, drag strips, uh, dragways, always fascinated me. And I spent a lot of time shooting with a wide lux uh, in this culture, largely um, a precursor to um, uh, suited astronauts. But um, this leads us up to basically this. So this took 20 years for me to be able to finally uh, earn the appropriate access and the trust to be able to go behind the scenes and document something, uh, qualities of, of space flight or sp uh, space preparation that basically goes beyond the kinds of news photography that is typically released through NASA uh, or that you typically see in the journals. I wanted to do something a lot more deep. And fortunately, I was able to do that. This was the mission that saved the Hubble Space Telescope. And um, so my project began in water. Astronauts, to learn to work in space, had to have to learn to do this in water. So it's appropriate that they train as you're doing here. So in this case, um, again, working simply, um, basically um, an SLR and uh, largely a 20 to 35 millimeter um, lens. And then I had a remote camera that was triggered by an infrared light. This was the first time this was ever done. This is the uh, neutral buoyancy lab down in Houston. Um, enormous amount of security, enormous amount of safety, run a lot of water. And I was able to do this because I worked extraordinarily simple. I'll just show you some of the photographs. I wanted the background to go dark. Otherwise, it's a fluorescent lit. You could tell by those lights. And I wanted to get a sense of, of, of the mood of the astronauts in training. Everything here is unscripted, I want to point out. Nobody is posing. So there's the shot. You can see the light off to the right. And that was remote. There were no cords. It was simple. And I could shoot. Um, by and darkening the background and getting these kinds of images um, as the astronauts get on this platform. And it gives it more of a, of a surrealistic look and maybe more of the look of feeling that these people trained to uh, train on Earth to work in space. One of the uh, qualities I had with this particular crew is um, fostering a great deal of trust. And one of the things I was playing with was giving them um, an artist easel. Uh, I'm not sure it's law of paper, but, um, and before they would go in the water or anything, I had them document this as a means of a setting up place and time. In this case, they were only um, 15 days from, yeah, about 15 days from, uh, from flight. This is John Grunsfeld in the uh, water. So, and again, going for the detail, this was very, very important to me, coming to the detail. And for this, I work with an 85 millimeter lens, typically uh, an F um, 1.4, and it gives me the depth of field and a very cinematic look. And I'm able to work quietly and come in there and just look at the whole, at the gesture. It's almost like, um, like ballet. The notion then of working with one's hands and craft has always appealed to me. And it often is an untold story in the, uh, in the evolution of the exploration of space, be it human or robotic. And so I spent a lot of time with the labor force. This is, was very important to me. Um, so these are close-ups that I did with the shuttle. Occasionally, if I wasn't working with 35 millimeter, I'm working with black and white film and I'm shooting with a Hasselblad on the 645 ratio. <clears throat> these are all available light. Um, in this case, uh, Greg worked on the uh, putting in the filling between each one of those tiles required a particular kind of filling before the uh, orbiter would be committed to space. Um, working around the rocket engines were fascinating. Uh, Craig stands before the, um, the opening for one of the engines. The engine is yet to be placed into the space shuttle. This is one of three. And again, I wanted to try to always give a sense of the scale of, the, um, of a space shuttle or any kind of vehicle so that we see something and realize how enormously big they are and how industrial the whole, the whole complex is. So one of the, one of the um, access events I had was being able to actually go into the engine compartment 
This is looking under the space shuttle. This is about 72 hours from launch. You'll see this hardware label, all this comes off. And this is just about three days before launch. But I was able to go into the engine compartment. And one of the things that I marveled at was kind of like looking at, at, at cars is the preciseness in the engineering. You look at this, this is like looking into a precision watch. And you realize you look at every solenoid, you look at every aspect of this, and it all works. It worked every time. There was never an accident with, with the orbiter itself. And you're seeing one of, the, one of the engines is below, one of them is to the right, and then there's one behind it, all three. And imagine all these things ignite and work absolutely at, at, at precision precision uh, speeds. And it turns like you know, decimal zero, zero, zero. We're looking at that kind of precision. And um, it, was, it was beautiful. And this was me inside. Um, my camera is down there. I was on a kind of a rubber cushion. And I gave this to one of the uh, technicians. What you're seeing on the right is the main fuel line leads to the, the fuel tank on, that's attached to the, to the shuttle. And it goes in then and divides, you see, between that engine behind me and the engine on the left. And then there's one in the front. And it gives you an idea of how big it is and yet how complicated it is. And that was my shot showing the three engines. Um, all in black and white negative. So any questions really in terms of why I work with black and white? Is black and white film still relative? Uh, yes, because um, I might add it prints beautifully on the MOA papers that I work with. This is um, a portrait I made of Craig. And I have to say, um, this I was very proud of. He, he, he was, this was about maybe four years, three years before the shuttles were gonna be retired. And he said he's probably going to go leave this and go to Orlando International Airport and be a jet mechanic. And that transition between coming off working in a rocket, on a rocket engine, with all that preciseness to working on a jet was, I thought, an amazing context. This is a portion of the shuttle wing. This gives you an idea of the, um, of the kind of distances we're working with the shuttle, again, black and white. Some of the labor force out of the launch pad. This is uh, Ravi. What we're looking at here is the uh, flame trench. Underneath the launch pad, there's a flame trench. And often when you see a rocket goes up, you see all that, what looks like white smoke. And really what it is, is steam because on the very top, the, the rocket engines, all the fire and heat come down from those, hit that blast shield. But there are also those pipes and enormous amounts of water are coming down to both abate the sound and cool things down, and that blast shield does that. Robbie down there um, was a, a um, an acoustical engineer, and part of his work responsibilities was checking out the um, the uh, the levels of the of the flame trench and the damage that may have been done. Each of those marks that kind of look like cave art uh, indicate that there was some damage that needed to be looked into. This is my portrait of Robbie, though. So I went from that to to this. 80 millimeter lens on a house of blood. It's that simple. These are some of the documents that um, I needed to have with me. Um, often I would have to have um, an escort, which seemed to be either one of the crew or um, a NASA person just basically um, at least within distance or in the area. So I could maintain my, my freedom to walk around and shoot. These were the various control areas down at the Kennedy Space Center. This is this is probably not going to change much when they get the new SLS rocket going with various areas that uh, you need to have codes to be able to visit. Um, this is part of the tractor system that's still in, in use down there. Um, this, I was going to go on that platform, which is about as big as a baseball field, and, um, and be transported um, out of the vertical assembly building where the shuttle or the rockets are assembled and taken out to the launch pad. So. In this case, you can see me on the far left. I've got the white hat. I'm the second person in. My escort is in the back. It's a NASA engineer. And I'm, you see, I've got the camera. I've got a, I'm shooting actually with a Hasselblad with about a 35 millimeter lens on. And I want you just to look at the scale. Remember I showed you I was in the engine compartment, but look at the size and the scale of all that, along with the, the technicians on the right. This was the photograph that I made. The platform is moving out on that crawler at about two miles an hour. This is the way it looks um, up on the platform. 
the you can see the tractor um, grooves in this in the sand, and the launch pad is out there in the far left underneath those clouds. It's about three miles away. That's about three miles. This is some close-ups of the actual um, crawler itself, and um, one of my favorite shots um, as these tacticians actually walk with it, almost processional, as it moves along, making sure it's oiled, making sure it's worked. This is 1960s era um, engineering and technology updated constantly, and now it's going into its second half century for use on the new um, SLS rockets. The astronauts, again, looking into this whole notion of, of exploring uh, obscure locations and behind the scenes, um, I was very, very fortunate that the crew uh, and the amount of space they gave me to follow them. And in this case, this was during their training. And um, this it was the small details to me that always matter beyond the obvious. Uh, Scott Alton's the commander of that particular mission. He was uh, a, a coffee drinker. Uh, we had a lot to share over coffee his glass case on the left. And I just thought this sort of summed up just some of the, the human aspects of this, of um, that we often don't see of individuals that are astronauts. The portrait sessions I had with them was quite um, exceptional. Um, actually never really been repeated um, by an outside photographer. Um, this uh, initially my project was done for the Discover Magazine at the time, but this is the sense of the of shooting the crew um, NASA wondered if I could do it in 20 minutes. I said, no, I'll need three hours. And then one day to prep and set up all the lighting. So, um, and that was the shot actually that I did with John with these lighting. Now to give you the background of why I showed is, was this location. And one of the reasons that I, I talk to clients and say, I need time to, to look at locations. If we're gonna do it, we we'll do it right. This is an acoustical laboratory, an entire building that tested out radio frequencies and like much like you'd see like in a sound room in a high-end um, you know, speaker um, store, this was there and I thought that would be a great background for the portraits. So I went in there just to look at it and ask them, you know, are these things movable? They are, everything was like Legos. This is the actual technicians of this particular building. They stood, sort of stood in for me. I just, this is all natural light, but I wanted to see if actually this would work and it did. Some months later, um, my assistant, uh, John, came in, we had our lighting, and um, the NASA folks were incredibly helpful as we set up um, the lighting system um, using um, both um, Shamira lighting um, uh, and strobe in this particular case. And that was the first test shot of, um, of Megan. Um, working with that light, we had a reflector off to the side and gave me exactly that look. And then that was the final portrait I did with the, um, the Hasselblad shooting on color negative film. I think the king here was that I measured the light and doing that, it really slowed me down. And that's, that's what I like most about it. Now this is on black and white film. This is Mike Bueno, Drew, John again, Megan. And then there was the crew shot. Now the training <clears throat> tends to be pretty extensive. And in this case, uh, here I'm working really again with um, probably the 85 millimeter lens. And um, the white glove they're wearing is exactly the kind of glove they wear when they're out in space. And so their training was wearing that glove so that they get the sensory um, association with that. And it becomes familiar in working in that kind of a gloved situation. Working with the tools, as we see here, um, is a critical part of being an astronaut and working in space. The, the piece of uh, equipment you see on the floor on the left was gonna be installed inside the Hubble Space Telescope. It's actually a computer system. And they were going through the various drill bits. This basically, you can see the glove also. This also prompted me to wanna do um, a study of the tools. Um, I found them beautiful. They were custom made, one of a kind. And to me, they were like pieces of sculpture. So. I wanted to photograph them. I got the permission to do that. And over several years, I was able to set up a light table and photograph uh, these various tools that essentially uh, were flown in space and used by the crew um, up on the Hubble Space Telescope or in the space shuttle itself. Um, 
So going into a room like this requires a lot of um, preparation. You can see some of my equipment's out there. Um, my flashes and stuff is already inside the room, which is behind me. Um, I have to put on those special shoes. Essentially, it's a bunny suit, uh, much of which like you're seeing in the pandemic with doctors. I mean, I have the full thing mask over my face. Um, once you're inside the room, there's no eating. They have one drinking fountain, but uh, you, you have to go search for it to drink. So um, that was the table I sat in. This is the high bay. This is at Goddard Space Flight Center in in um, in Maryland. And basically, I had a light underneath the table, curtained it off, and a bounce light. And Mark Jarosz was the senior engineer for um, training the crew on, on the uh, use of these tools. So I've got the mini port, uh, mini um, power drill on the table. You can see me on the left on the ladder. And that was a shot. These shots, these images, um, some of these were exhibited at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum. Um, they were printed on uh, Moab and Shroud of paper, printed on Canon 60-inch um, uh, uh, printer, I believe. And um, I love the quality of that. And they're now in the permanent collection of the uh, National Air and Space Museum. Any questions so far? How are we doing, Mark? Anything? Uh, sorry about that. Yes, um, Kevin had a uh, Ken. Sorry, had asked earlier when you were talking about film, mm -hmm. uh, why you're shooting on film and not digital, given the uh, low light situations that you're shooting in. Well, it's a good question, Kevin. Probably to appreciate is that as I came of age and working with film, I learned how to push film. So whether the film had a rating at 400 or 800, or I was shooting with some of the Ilford films that were rated at 3200 and pushing it to 6400, I was aware of the various chemistries. I have a lab here in New York that I work with, and we work in, in testing the chemistry to be able to push that level of, um, yeah, of lighting. And I intentionally know it's going to be extraordinarily difficult. Obviously, it's easier. You just If you're having a digital camera, you have some of the, the newer equipment that can go up to like 20, 30,000 without much noise. Um, but um, that pretty much is it. I pretty much a trax based film or a, or a, or a Ilford based film. And sometimes they have the 3200 level films and I would just push those to stop, maybe two stops because just the, just the grainy quality looked very good. And following the crew through some of the training, um, I wanted to try to capture some of that some of the things we don't see. This is Scott Altman, who was the commander of the uh, of that particular mission. He's getting ready to fly the T-38 behind him. Um, if you saw Top Gun, the original Top Gun, um, all the um, shots that didn't involve Tom Cruise in, the, um, in those jets was actually this guy here flying them. It was he and his squadron, he shot this in Florida. Um, I would travel and fly with him anywhere, any place. And that was the portrait. So you can see on the left, I had one, just one basic light, all TTL, and um, to get something like that, yeah. This is inside a trainer. Um, I wish it was inside the shuttle, but this is actually a, a exact replica. And I got to go along on, um, on some of the training and in this one, uh, we were they were doing a, a deorbit, coming in from orbit and landing. And I got to be in the jump seat behind uh, Scooter on the left and Ray J on the right. This film was probably pushed three stops. I couldn't move much because I had one of those, those seat belts that come from the middle where, where it's so the uh, everything is locked into a circle and, and by your over your chest. Here they are training um, in another simulation. The crew books. One of the things that caught in the, in the month before flight is the fatigue that this takes. The amount of focus and training is just extraordinary. And where was just in a room. 
and yet I was simulating a part of the shuttle and going through the idea of a, of a, of a re-entry. Light. One of the aspects that always fascinated me about space was the quality of light, particularly when film was used between 1962 and about 2004 or five, film was exclusively used on all human spaceflight missions until they went digital. And so uh, when I was with this crew, I asked them what the quality of light was like in space. And um, they asked me to give them a number of, of training seminars to, to beyond their, the technical aspects of shooting a camera, how they can make better pictures when they're up in space. So we did three different sessions and um, we talked, um, I showed examples of, of early flight photography and gave them a sense of what they could do in terms of just looking and appreciating the light, even though it's pretty tense out there and becoming aware even of little things like the reflection off the telescope on the left, that's the Hubble on the left. That's one of the bunny suits. Um, probably could use one of those here in New York, but anyways, um, get an idea with the guy on the left what this was like um, before you go into anything around a spacecraft. The amount, the dust free is absolutely important. And my cameras before we go in are all cleaned down with a form of uh, isopropyl alcohol. It's all cleaned down by a technician with a swab and everything is absolutely you know dust free. Now, <clears throat> The crew, one of the um, fortunate accesses that I got was being with them on the day of their launch. And I am, I am grateful to this day of having um, that privilege of being with them. My influence, and the influences are very important, at least for me, in looking at history influence. This is a photograph of, uh, of Al Shepard, made in 1961 before he was the first American to go on a suborbital flight. And I don't know who the photographer was, but I always thought this was great because it was unscripted. There was nothing posed here. And back in those days, this is the kind of work that was there. And, um, and then this kind of thing. This photograph, I said, wow, this is just amazing. All parts of the hull. And I said, if I could ever do something like that, that would be the influence. Well, I had my chance four hours before um, the crew was to leave, they were suiting up and I got to make, begin making pictures um, in the actual suit-up room that, that Neil Armstrong and all the Apollo guys uh, used before they went to the moon. And all the new crews will be using when they go to the moon in this particular room. And this is the way it looks. Um, you can see the gloves up right over there. That's for Scooter. There we go. And again, his glasses on the right, his gloves, all these parts of the hole. Trying to explore this part of my storytelling. And there was that look. I was able to even though there were NASA photographers, there was one in there photographing, and of course they would all look and smile. I knew that each one of this crew had things on their mind and they just sort of was zoning out for a few seconds. And that to me told the story. I mean, they're ready to get on a rocket ship full, fully loaded with fuel and fly up to 17,000 miles an hour to get into space. Risky business. So at the launch pad, scooter looking up at the um, at the shuttle. This is the elevator they take. We rarely get to see this. All these various levels. They're going to be getting off at the 195 level. <clears throat> so the elevator is going up in this particular case. Uh, that elevator is still there, by the way. And then they go into the access to the white room, which is that sort of that um, that cantilevered uh, that goes out over the launch pad up into the um, um, spacecraft. And that's what looks inside, you see the hatch. And again, I got to spend some time there with them prepping this. Uh, Renee was one of the technicians, um, just amazing in their scope and understanding and the procedures, following some of the same procedures that went back to the Mercury days, almost 40, 50 years earlier. These are the tools that they bring with them, they keep with them at all times. This is just one of the several cases. And you can see um, the space helmet. They're going to get in on that little that little block over there and slide in. And the crew and the tech crew will help them get into their um, their seats and uh, buckle them in for lunch. Here they're closing up the hatch. In the firing room, 
uh, there's procedures, lots and lots of procedures. Yes, it may all be on computer, but there are books. And that fascinated me as well. This, this is one of three aisles in the master computer room that used to simply launch a space shuttle. When it comes to launching the new SLS, I would think that this is probably going to be six times larger than this. And every single one of these computers are used to go into working every aspect of the flight down to decimal zero, 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 zero. That's how precise we're looking at. Mike Linebeck was the, um, the uh, flight director. And I've been the flight director for every shuttle mission from 2000 all the way through the last mission in 2011, including Columbia. My goal was to be on top of that building. That's the vertical assembly building. It's about 420 feet high. Getting on top of it was extraordinarily restrictive. And I wanted to set up my, uh, my camera systems up there because I had a camera, I had cameras out, remote cameras out by the launch pad with some help. But I wanted to be on top of that building. Well, to do that takes a lot of signing off on. And while this kind of photograph took a lot of time to get up there and make something like this, uh, black and white film, by the way. This is the document, and I had to have something like nine people sign off on this to get that permission to go up on top of the uh, on top of the vertical assembly building on the roof. Just to give you an idea. And once that was done, this is the equipment. Um, I have the long lens behind me, my camera case, the Hasselblad, and then there's a drive then out to um, to the uh, vertical assembly building. Here I am on top. Um, these are two additional NASA people that came up with us. Uh, and you can see far to my right, you can see the launch pad, which is out there. That's, that's approximately three and a half miles away. I've got something like, a, I believe it's a four, 400 millimeter um, F2.8. And that's the shot that I made. So you go from there to that. And the advice given to me by all the news guys is just, let it come. Don't don't feel you got to bang away and click away. Just just feel every moment. Good advice. That was with uh, the remote camera that we had positioned uh, 90 degrees to my flank. That was also three and a half miles away. I think we had a um, I think we had a 135 on for that one. And that's the contrail. Left after lunch. And there we are in space. Crew did very well, by the way, um, and looking at light. And this is the way it looked on the ground as that mission proceeded. This is some of the crew shots taken actually during the mission. I um, was very happy for them that they could capture that focus. There's paperwork up in space, too. It's not all holograms. In Star Trek, uh, there's paper. And this was actually the procedures they were going to use for their um, five spacewalks to fix the, uh, fix the Hubble. These aren't my pictures, I wish. This is one of the crew. And just finding little things around. This is a Velcro, this is a, a drink. And of course there's Velcro everywhere, you see it? And when you're done with a the drink, they just would leave it there. So I love that they caught that detail. Through a hatch, and now they're going through the airlock. I really like the sequence. You can see the blue out there, that's the reflection from the Earth of the earth light coming on the spacesuit. So one crew member is already outside the hatch in the cargo bay. He's coming through. And then that's the way the shot looked. We were looking from the televised camera um, and Mark is making that shot um, going onto the cargo bay. So this is just some of the shots the crew made. I was very, very proud of the images and the thoughtfulness that went into some of this. Cameras you see are coated because of the extreme cold. Um, I asked them to play along with the reflective surfaces of the Hubble, maybe try a self-portrait, and uh, John obliged. This is a great moment when they all got back and hugged each other. I really think this is a great image. And that was the book, um, Infinite Worlds. And John Glenn, as you know, was the first American to orbit the Earth, and very grateful um, that John was able to write this forward um, for me. Um, and you go to the website if you're interested in, in getting the book uh, through Amazon. So um, any questions?
Yeah, we got a few here. Yeah. Um, we'll start with a board general question from Deborah, and then we'll move on to some uh, some technical questions from Robert. For Deborah is asking, have you had an opportunity to work with SpaceX on any NASA partnered projects? I have not. Okay. Um, no, I have not. SpaceX is a uh, is extraordinary because it's private, um, and there's some proprietary issues, of course, going on. They're very restrictive. I would like to, um, but um, the launch images that you see, you know, are, are well taken. But in terms of the kind of work that you're seeing here, um, no, there's not, I haven't seen that kind of work. But yes, I would like to, but no, I haven't. And Robert's asking about uh, black and white film processing. So using TriX process, <coughs> what type of developer if you're developing that yourself? And um, if you're using D76, is it diluted one-to-one -one? for those who are darkroom savvy? Uh, probably. <clears throat> I think in this case, um, I run tests. Um, we might have been using some other variation of D76, that, like, like a microfine or something to be able to push that because sometimes there's two developer solutions where you can do part of your development um, for um, highlights and another one for shadows. But yeah, I would typically follow the, yeah, we pretty much follow the guidelines that are with the film. So yeah, D76 is probably likely. And Don is asking, how did you set the exposure for the rocket launch shots? Um, a lot of wisdom, typically, um, between five hundredth and a thousandth of a second, and about between about two stops underexposed. And Robert has a question about the, for the black and white shots. Sure. Uh, K two and A filters. He's asking. I'm not sure what's the question. Yeah, I don't know what uh, K two or. Um, Robert, if you can follow up with us yeah. about what filter, I, I assume if you're applying filtration on the end of your lens, but uh, Robert. Only once, there was um, the shot of the shuttle, the um, sky was very dark and the shuttle was extraordinarily white. That was sort of, um, I forgot what it was, it SX something, it was an Ilford film. And it tends to uh, capture light more towards the infrared. And on that I put, um, oh, I forgot the number, a 25 or something, a, a really red filter over the lens. And, um, you know, I lose, there's a filter factor involved, but the, the quality was just extraordinary. So talk a little bit about your post-production. So you've had a few exhibitions, I think uh, one most recently at the Smithsonian. Um, and you said that you use primarily Juniper. Explain a little bit about your paper choice and about your printing process and what printer you're using and why you chose a combination, just a little bit on that. Sure. So um, <clears throat> actually, that's that's pretty good. I just want to mention, Mark, as you go in that, <clears throat> that achieving the kinds of results and the opportunities that I've been fortunate to have, um, I couldn't do this alone. And so I've been very fortunate to have great support, not only from Mark and the folks at Moab, and we're going to show that, but the folks at Canon, um, in the printing, that has been a, a remarkable journey for almost the last decade. And the camera systems are extraordinary. Ezo supports me on the monitor systems. Um, I wouldn't go near anything else. I just absolutely, um, Ezo and, their, and the systems that automatically color balance the screen automatically, fabulous. Sinale supplies the, um, the LED lighting I'm using when I'm out in remote, and I'll show you that. And Glyph Technology supports me on the external hard drives that I take out into the field and use here um, in, the, um, in the studio office to back up all my, um, all my work. On the MOA part, on my flow, <clears throat> typically all the files that I shoot, <clears throat> I tend to download um, not on location. Although if I have to, I, I will. And I have, um, I use one of these one terabyte, um, uh, Glyph has one of these um, really great, almost the thing is probably not more than four or five inches long by about two inches. It's a terabyte. And I bring that along. It, it's rugged, uh, dust proof, and it's light enough. And if I have to download directly off um, from the camera, I can do that. Otherwise, I do it back, say, at the hotel or something. All the files are typically then stored. Um, I back them up three times. I keep them on one on, a, on, a, on that small little terabyte drive. 
I have another external drive. I put it on as another backup, and then I keep it on the computer's hard drive. When I get back, <clears throat> I process these um, in Adobe's Lightroom. Um, it gives me enough flexibility to work the curves if I have to. Put all the necessary um, 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 text in, copyright, what have you, all that, all the kind of um, um, data. The in the workflow, when I'm ready to do a lot of editing, I have to say, when it comes to deciding, for example, for the exhibition at um, at the Air and Space Museum <clears throat> or at the Kennedy Space Center, that's what this is for, actually, for Kennedy Space Center, um, I chose Moab's uh, Entrada paper, and I was going to be printing on Canon's, um, I believe, their, their, uh, their 60 inch and I believe they're 48 inch uh, printing machines. And here we've got everything running through Photoshop. And these are my guides. And then here you can see the prints coming off of the printer. Um, I, I can't tell you how much I love the ink quality of the Canon printers. And that with the Moab, particularly on the Entrada or the Juniper is just fabulous for my taste. I just I swear by it. The quality is just almost like 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 reviewer. This is one of the images at the Smithsonian. This is about forty-eight inches by forty, I think. We were doing rolls, I think, on this one. Yeah. Now this looks. This is one of the images that was going to go down in the permanent collection at the Kennedy Space Center, the Visitor Center, and here they're putting on the, the aluminum back um, uh, before framing. So it gives you the quality of the of the print. How how, how good it looks! It's just just beautiful. Um, so that's the essence. I've got other shots, Mark. I'll go through um, where I can show some more of that flow, but um, but that's pretty much the arc of it. And then I I store everything on external hard drives. Um, I could probably yeah. It, it's all accessed. I keep everything. I create a Lightroom. I create catalogs for every new project. And um, the, the the essence when I'm working on the, for example, on the um, with the Moab paper and the Canon printers, um, we'll have um, Evan, who works with Mark, will will create ICC profiles so that we're getting the best out of the machine and paper. Um, so getting the pro ICC profiles and customizing it is an extraordinarily important process. Um, I work with a, um, a Canon Pro 1000 here, and the same was created here. We created profiles for, for Juniper and for uh, Informal Lab and Trollet. Is there anything else I can add to that, Mark? Um, no, for those who, you mentioned Evan Parker. He, right. if anybody's been through our webinars before, he we kind of bring him on here maybe once a month just to ask or answer technical questions. We're going to bring him back, I believe, at the end of this month again, just to open him up for any, any technical questions that people have. Um, he's very good at what he does, believe me. <laughs> yeah, we, he's, he's... Wow, I learn something every time. Uh, let me see. There's some other questions coming in sure. here. Um, you mentioned your media type, and Trotta and Juniper you use. Um, if uh, Arpad asks, if you were to shoot Today, using digital, would your vision change? No, that's actually a good question. No, understand that what I when I'm and I'll be showing you. I work often with both a, with a, an analog film camera, typically a Hasselblad like the H2. Um, or I'm even looking at maybe getting the six by six five hundred three, but I typically work with the Canon um, 5D, 5DX, 5D Mark II, um, and lenses. So I've been working digital since 2006, I think. 2005, 2006. So I, I, I work it appropriately. I mean, digital certainly is necessary, but my vision is something that is something that I've worked on for decades. The technology does not give me my vision. The technology is a tool. The same way that a space probe is a tool for humans to get data and study whatever they're setting the probe out to do. So the, the vision is something that that you acquire, and and for me, it I spent a lot of time and still do looking at masters of photography. I like looking at the history of photography. Um, one of my influences was Henry Cartier-Bresson, who was one of the first to successfully work with a 35 millimeter camera back in the 30s, 40s, 50s. And that discipline of working quietly and composing full frame um, made an enormous impact on me. 
there are other people like uh, Walker Evans, I mean, Aaron Siskin, um, Irving Penn. I mean, yeah. So I think the vision and my point of view is has been cultivated by first looking at the masters and then going out and looking at the way I look at things. All that technology is simply just that. It's a tool. Next. Sep asks uh, different papers for color and black and white. No, not necessarily. Um, I printed, no, I mean, I think that uh, for me, at least on the, on, the, on the negatives that I use that I scan, I, I scan them on a, um, on the, um, on the X, was it the X5? And um, I found that, that um, the Moab and Trada prints black and white beautifully on the can, on the can, me with a Canon printer. It gives me almost a gravure-like look, and gives me that tonal range, and gives me the D max I'm looking for, um, and Juniper, which I've been using for other kinds of exhibition purposes, gives me a different kind of black, doesn't it? A more deep black, and more appropriate, I think, for uh, for galleries, and for exhibition types. So, um, so I, yeah, I think the paper, I think the paper that Moab makes is very versatile for um, for both black and white and color. You showed a um, the cover of your book, Infinite Worlds. Is where can people buy that? Or sure. What? Well, thank you for asking. If you go to my website and go to books, um, there is a link right there. If you just go there and click the, the little picture, the icon of the cover, it'll take you to Amazon as one example, and you can buy the book from them, or you can buy it from Barnes and Noble. Um, and so the book is is very much um, available and. Hopefully we cross paths, I'll sign it for you. But thank you for asking. Those are pretty much, we're caught up with all the questions um, right within the hour. So if anybody has any last minute questions, because I just want to ask one question that I was curious about, about to Michael. But I've got I, a few more pictures though. Uh, do you? Go ahead, yeah. go for it. Um, my question mm -hmm. to you as you cue this up is, how did you get involved in, in this documentary project? Because mm -hmm. from RIT, Wow. To what's what what took you to those steps? Because I think that a lot of people are curious about that and in awe of your access and, and how you got there. Wow, profound question. You got another hour? <laughs> um, the essence of that, I've always wanted to get behind the scenes of everything. I wanted to be a part of something, see something, photograph it. And that goes back actually to high school. <clears throat> um, I went to college to be a planetary geologist. Um, that didn't really work out because I really enjoyed taking pictures a whole lot more. Um, I enjoyed photographing the various geologic features, you know, the synclines, anticlines, sedimentation, what have you, um, meandering rivers. Um, and it wasn't really until after um, undergrad that I um, went to graduate school and really wanted to cultivate both myself, technically, I mean, I put myself through school working in the labs at Eastman Kodak Company. So that gave me a lot of my technical background. Graduate work, which I did at RIT, was really about uh, learning a, a vision, how I look at things and help me tap into that and being uniform about it and being disciplined about it, as well as being, as well as getting my craft down, whether in terms of developing, printing, um, and really getting that down, that quote, that, that down. I think that um, that curiosity of being both in something that's unfolding and being invisible to others while it's happening is um, a very important trait. And I would say that pretty much has followed me throughout my career. Um, I think that way people, you, you got unscripted work. I, and that's the key to my work, unscripted. Yes, there is scripted work, public relations pictures, advertising, what have you. Yes, those are all necessary and you want the scripted um, picture. I, I seek the unscripted. Even my fashion work was unscripted. I would, I would always pretty much have my models and, and the kind of projects we would get to let me decide the image or the photograph. And they'd be, I say, set up, we're going to have you go from point A to point B, or we'll do this or we'll do that. Because I was looking for that found moment. And it's really been one of perfection. So, I mean, I keep on perfecting it. Um, looking for the little details. Um, I do that as though, I think for the, for the people that I have met over all these years that are involved 
in the exploration of space um, that they often take for granted a lot of the things they see around. And I try to think what they take for granted, most people don't see. And that's what I try to bring to a viewer, the things they typically can't see. But if they were able to walk in those halls, walk in that environment, they'd be able to actually see the incredible details beyond the typical picture of just a rocket taking off. That sort of answer. Mark. Sorry there. Had a had a technical. Yeah. Did that sort of answer it? Yeah, no, very much so. Did I did I lose anything that I was saying or we're we good? No, we're we're great. So right. we have about five more minutes. All so right. So let, let me run you through this. The, another project I worked on and still do was the New Horizon NASA New Horizons mission to the Pluto system. I got on board that in 2005, and to this day, I'm a part of that team. And I just wanted to show you a sense now, this is a Cine uh, the Cineo lighting. And again, all the experience I had from working on the, um, on the shuttle Hubble project, I brought to bear on this project. This is the mirror system for the camera that was gonna be on board the uh, New Horizons probe. And just taking parts of the hull and looking at them as pieces of sculpture. This is the CCD camera system of the probe that went to Pluto. This is some of the labor force. That's the probe itself. This picture you'll see on my website. It's been published everywhere, National Geographic, the New York Times, Smithsonian, Wired Magazine. Um, it's a spin test. Here's the launch remote camera system. Believe me, I'm not there making that picture. This is all remote. Um, during the mission, it took nine and a half years to get there. I worked again with that concept of a pad and had each one of the planetary scientists write something down that meant something to them because we were still two years away, this is 2012, we were still three years away from the possible reconnaissance of Pluto. So I wanted them to write down what they, to draw or write what they felt. And these are just some examples of that. These are some of the credentials I had. And um, this is during the week of the flyby to Pluto. This is July, 2015. Um, again, looking for all the details. It is rocket science, by the way. I mean, these are some of the people that had key positions in that particular mission. Um, um, Alice. This is the camera systems. This is inside the main room where all the scientists met every day. Here you see like, like the cannons, the lenses, um, the power book. Uh, to the left of the power book would be the, um, the glyph external hard drive um, and some of the lighting systems. And it was the kind of pictures that I was um, getting. This was all very restricted and off limits to, to the media. So they're starting to get initial results as the probe got closer and closer to Pluto. Yes, this is Brian May of Queen. He was one of the, Dr. Brian May was one of the, the scientists um, of this mission um, dealing with, um, with stereo imaging. So this is the morning of the first time they're looking at the first images from Pluto. They have waited all the careers. Um, most of these guys here just got their doctorate waiting for that. And that was a shot that really became quite famous um, responding to the very first. They saw this before anybody, before the image was officially released to, to the press and to the world. It was about 6.30 in the morning that morning. So this is some ideas of me working. This is taken by another one of the um, scientists. Uh, um, and I tend to just blend in and look. In this case, <clears throat> this is the atmospheres they're, they're studying. I want to get a different look. So I, um, I'm going to do there, right, off to the side. And I'm shooting now with <clears throat> a little bit of a longer lens. And that was the image. This is the, the final, did the probe, was the probe successful? And this is inside the control room. Um, it was just me and Bill Ingalls, who's a NASA photographer and a video person. Everybody else was outside of the room. Alice is the, the manager and very much wanted me there. And you can see me, this is the video being fed live. And you can see me off to the left photographing. And that was shots I was doing, souping very low, wide angle lens up. There I am over there photographing that. And there I am photographing Alan and we got that. And there I am down there in the middle, stooped down, and that was the shot. 
again, trying to get that sense of unscripted storytelling. This is a shot of Alan two hours after the launch. This is what Pluto looked like in two th January 2006. My intention was to, to make a similar kind of photograph after it passed Pluto. And that was the shot. Nine and a half years later. So that's some of the equipment that I work with. You can see the Sunil lighting on the left. Cameras, louvers, light meters. See the light meter? That's still there. Um, this is part of the Parker Solar Probe. This is now in flight to the sun. And this is the way I was photographing this. Um, I look at it as a piece of sculpture. It was actually the sun shield for the probe. You see me on the left photographing it. And that was the image I was really seeking to get. She was one of the senior engineers on the project. Here I am in the room with the satellite on the, on the, on the right. And you can see the signal light on the left. And that was a shot I made. To have this amount of access is a trust that I can be around this equipment and not do anything stupid. That is so important. Um, and again, looking for contrast. So um, maybe we'll leave it off at that, Mark. I don't know. I was going to go off into my flame trench pictures. Um, no, that's good. No, we we're about to get. Uh, well, then I'm and, just going to go yeah. through here and just go down here to the beginning. There's the paper I work. Here, this is the exhibition down at Daytona on Juniper paper. And um, here we are printing off on the 4,000. And that's the way it looked in the exhibition. So I want to thank all my um, supporters. I want to thank all of you for tuning in. And um, um, I'm offered private tutorials. If any of you are interested in private lessons and looking at your work and how to make better storytelling, you can reach me through my uh, website and my email. I'll be happy to uh, discuss it with you.